Hi, senior apologetic students. This is Mr. Bearford. I wanted to go over your Unit 6 study guide before you guys took your Unit 6 test. This is pretty brief. It only covers about three concepts, three chapters. Um, and I especially wanted to go over um, this last one, God in Hell, because I didn't necessarily assign the reading on that. I just listed the resources. But let's see how quickly we can go through some of this. So this covers the topics of Christianity and science. Are they, you know, are they compatible or are they enemies? Um, that's chapter 14, without a doubt. Um, this c covers the topic also of uh, God and evil, or God and suffering. That was chapter 19, and without a doubt. And we also had some Rassman and Strobel sources on that. And it also covers the topic of God and hell. Um, the, the, the key resource there is still the, um, the samples text, but that's, that's probably the one I have, you know, of all the chapters in the samples book that I have maybe some criticisms of the way he addresses it, the God and Hell one would, would be one of them, but that's okay. We'll, we'll talk about it before you guys uh, take the test here. So let's start going through these. Starting with um, Christianity and science. This is a quote that was in that chapter. Science was stillborn in other great civilizations outside Christian Europe because prevailing ideas not only failed to nourish, but also stifled its development. Um, this, this is going to be on your test in multiple questions. It's the idea that what gets credit for the birth of modern science? Christianity or atheism slash naturalism? And the answer is Christianity. Modern science was born in, developed in, nurtured by a Christian civilization. And a lot of the key names that you learn about in a history class or a science class for their scientific discoveries or innovations or whatever a lot of those men were Christians. If you're studying studying that era of modern you know, Europe in which modern science began. All right, so number one, it says, know how certain pagan views are not conducive to the scientific enterprise, pages 188, 189. You know, a cyclical view of time, you know, you know why, 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 study, why study how things work in terms of cause and effect if it's all just cyclical anyways, who cares to understand it? Um, a divine view of nature why study nature if that would offend the gods um, or an animistic view of nature? I wouldn't dare chop down that tree if that's mother tree, but, but I can study these things if they're not divine, if they, if they are common, I'm allowed to study them. Or even an illusory view of nature like you might have in Hinduism. If nature is not real, if, if, if it's just a product of my mind like you have in Christian science or some concepts in Hinduism, and why bother studying it at all? Those are the kinds of things that you'll see on those pages. Certain pagan views do not encourage science at all. All right, number two, know the Christian truth claims that support our textbook says support the scientific... Sorry, that sentence is awful. Know the Christian truth claim that our textbook says support the scientific enterprise. Okay, that's how that sentence should have gone. Um, look at page uh, 192 and following. I'm not going to read all of these, but the, this is material that you've got to kind of have on you when you take the test. So things like the physical universe is a distinct objective reality, or the laws of nature exhibit order, patterns, and regularity. To me, that's a big one. Um, the physical universe is intelligible. The world is good, valuable, and worthy of careful study. Because the world is not divine and therefore not a proper object of worship, it can be an object of rational study. So that's just a small handful. There's like 10 of these that Samples gives. These are all claims that Christians believe that are very um, supportive of science, and you can't really do science without them. All right, what does modern science say about the universe? Does the Bible agree or disagree with these findings? The key idea there is that modern science does agree that the universe has a beginning that it's not eternal. Um, and the Bible, of course, teaches that, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Does naturalism provide, this is number four, provide or justify the necessary preconditions for science? No, and I said page 192 and following in your samples textbook, as soon as you get to page 195, samples is gonna ask all these questions. Let me just read one of them. Um, aren't the order, regularity, and uniformity of nature out of place in a purely naturalistic world? Or how about this one? Um, if the sensory organs, think my eyes and ears, and cognitive faculties of human beings are the result of chance and accident, how can they be trusted to yield coherent data, much less objective truth? 
In other words, in, with, with a naturalistic worldview where everything's pure chance, there's no design, you know, that, that things exist at all as a fluke, that life exists at all as a fluke, that intelligent life exists as a fluke. Um, if those things are true, then how can we be expected to have certain knowledge about any of it, which is what the scientific endeavor is after, right? An understanding of these things. So ultimately naturalism doesn't support science. All right, uh, chapter 19 of Without a Doubt covered this um, idea of the problem of evil. The problem of evil is usually presented with three statements that allegedly can't all be true. The first statement is that God is good or all loving. The second statement is that um, God is all powerful. And the third statement is that evil and suffering exist. So then the, the question is begged, if God is good and all-loving, and he's all-powerful, he could do something about it, then why do evil and suffering exist? Why didn't this all-good, all-loving God do something about it? Now, of course, the Christian answer is he has in Jesus Christ, and he will in Jesus Christ. This is what the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus mean. Um, that God has, does, and will do something about suffering and evil. It's just not necessarily what, you know, the, the skeptic is looking for in an answer to that question. But let me go through some of these bullet points quickly. God might allow evil if it would produce a greater good. Um, God has allowed evil, right? So that's going back to Adam and Eve in the garden. We'll talk about that in a minute. But God has allowed evil, and God has brought about greater good, um, even through evil, right? Take uh, take the death of Jesus on a cross. That's about the most evil thing humans could have done, murder God's son. And if out of that evil thing, God brought about the greatest good, the atonement of all of our sin, then God, of course, has allowed evil and has produced greater good in spite of it and even through it. Um, so God not only might, but he does do this. God created us as morally responsible beings with the ability to reason and act. Um, this is true, right? So we, we, we are responsible for our good choices and our bad choices. So we don't get to pin evil on God. We'll see that in just a minute. Eliminating wickedness, even for God, may not be an immediate and painless task if a greater good is to be achieved. Um, you can't get rid of sin without getting rid of the sinners who are doing the sinning. God doesn't want to get rid of sinners. He wants to redeem and save us. So he sends us his son, Jesus, who does redeem and save us. And how he redeemed and saved us was neither immediate nor painless. Right? The cross was both, both uh, drawn out and very painful. Um, but God does, not, um, God does not desire just to get rid of wickedness or get rid of sinners. He will, he will right? but ultimately he desires to redeem us such that we are no longer sinners. And we can be with him in uh, the new heavens and new earth. Atheism does not offer a coherent explanation to the problem of evil. Atheism can't demonstrate morality at all. Atheism can't um, explain why there's such a thing as good, much less evil, right? So if there's no objective moral standard, you can't have good, and therefore you can't complain about evil. What evil? But of course there is evil, and the Christian and the pagan and the atheist, we all know this, there is such a thing as evil, and that's why we're talking about it. Why is there evil, and if there is a God, why doesn't he do something about it? Um, the historic explanation of evil goes back to the garden. God made everything good. At the end of the day six, he declared it all very good and rested in his good work on day seven. But sometime after, um, Adam and Eve disobeyed that one command they were given not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? So tempted by Satan that they could become like God himself, knowing good from evil. Um, Eve, apparently deceived, took the fruit and ate. And her husband, who was with her, who should have known better and stood up to the liar, Satan um, didn't. He rebelliously ate also. So the historic explanation of evil pins it on the devil, the tempter, and on us for disobeying God. You can't blame God for evil. Evil is not a tangible substance. Instead, it is an absence of goodness in the will of a creature. All right, this comes from Augustine. Augustine said evil isn't, isn't a thing in and of itself. Evil is just the absence of good. He used uh, the analogy of light, right? Like darkness isn't a thing. Darkness is just the absence of light. If that's analogous to good and evil, then evil is not a thing. It's just the absence of good, a deprivation of good. There's some use in this. It can also be critiqued. The use in it is kind of what I, what I already said earlier, that 
if, if the skeptic of, you know, Christians not having a good answer to the problem of evil says, you know, hey, um, why wouldn't your God do something about evil? We can talk about, well, what is good and what is evil? And we'll find that the skeptic or the atheist often has no way to objectively define good or evil. So if there's, if there's no objective good or evil, if there's just opinion, I like this, I don't like that, then we, we can't just pin this problem on the believer in God. The unbeliever in God also needs some rational explanation for good and evil, and they don't have one, not at all. The Christian does have a rational explanation for good and evil, um, but we acknowledge that there is evil and that God does something about it, but has not ultimately finished doing that thing about it. We, we are still waiting for the new heavens and new earth, thus the struggle with suffering and with evil in the meantime. All right, um, the critique of Augustine's view of this and, and making it analogous to, you know, darkness and light would be that perhaps it belittles evil to say that evil isn't a thing in and of itself. It's just the absence of good. When we actually talk about real evil actions committed by one person onto another person, we don't want to belittle those evil actions in any way. Um, we don't want to belittle the suffering that was caused. So it's to say that evil isn't a thing, it's just an absence of good. That may be, if we're not carefully communicating what, I, what we mean, that may belittle the suffering of another person and we wouldn't ever want to do that. So that's where it's perhaps critiquable. Uh, the reasons God might allow evil to continue, look at 2 Peter 3, God is patient, right? God, God doesn't just end evil now because he'd have to end sinners now, but instead he's patient with sinners, wanting us to repent of our sin and believe in Jesus for our salvation. All right, God in hell. Um, this is um, also in the samples text, the Rassman um, linked resources and the Strobel linked resources. So let's go through some of these quickly. Why is there a hell? Hell is, and hear, hear me carefully on this, hell is God's good response, just response to sin. Jesus tells us that hell was made for the devil and his angels. So we know that hell isn't justice against us. It's justice against Satan and demons. God's justice against us looks very different. It looks like a particular human suffering on a cross. And instead of that being you or me, that's Jesus. So God's justice against the devil and the demons is hell. God's justice against your and my sin is what Christ paid on the cross. So why is there a hell? Hell is God protecting us from our enemy, the devil and the demons. It is not where God desires you or I to be. Um, hell could be empty of all humanity. It sadly won't be, but it could be if we just believe in Jesus for our forgiveness. Um, God is life, so separation from God means death. That That's a way to see hell as... Um, really a natural consequence of sin. If God is life and he makes us in his image, so we're alive and God intends for us to live and not die, um, death is the result of sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, right? Um, then if you are separated from God, how could you continue to be alive? And that's what hell is. Hell is this eternal separation from God. So of course you're, you're dead. Um, only in heaven where we're with God forever are we alive forever, eternal life. So um, hell is, is the eternal separation from God, and therefore it is eternal death, as Scripture describes it. Um, Christianity is unique because of Christ who suffers with and for sinners. No other world religion or philosophy um, can provide a good answer for the problem of evil. They either, they either try to make God not omnipotent, or make God not loving, or somehow explain away evil and suffering as some sort of illusion or belittle it in some way. Christianity upholds all three, that God is all-powerful, and God is all-good and loving, and evil and suffering are very real, um, but God's response to it is unique. God's response to it is the life, death, and resurrection of his Son, and the promise of resurrection on the last day when Jesus returns to raise the living and the dead, and all who believe go to heaven with him. Uh, scriptural view of hell versus false teaching. So some have, in Christian circles, have tried to kind of tweak the, uh, the historical view of hell. The historical view of hell is that it's a real place. It's where God is going to send the devil and his angels, and also tra the devil and demons, in other words, fallen angels, and also tragically unbelievers. It's not necessary for any person to go to hell, but a person will be in hell if they, if they, reject, if they reject Jesus, if they reject God. 
Um, so it's a real place. A false view of hell tries to make it not a 